Hi, I'm Nancy Picard, and I'm a Master Integrative Life Coach, and I'm so happy you decided to join me here today. And I'm honored to act as your guide to discuss the science behind happiness and how it can improve your life. I'm motivated to help you achieve better health and wellness by unlocking the secrets behind being happy every day. If you have any questions at any time, just send me an email at nancy at nancypicardlifecoach.com. So the dictionary defines happiness as the state of being happy, which sounds obvious but ambiguous. Other definitions include good fortune, a state of well-being and contentment, a pleasurable or satisfying experience. Still, none of these explain what happiness actually is. The field of psychology describes happiness as the experience of frequent positive emotions, such as joy, interest, pride, and infrequent negative emotions, such as sadness, anxiety, stress, and anger. So now we're getting a little closer. To get a little bit more specific, I'm gonna go with the following definition. Happiness is the appreciation of life, moments of pleasure, but overall it has to do with the positive experience of emotions. So let's dig a little bit deeper. In a TED talk by Dan Gilbert, he used an example he provided comparing happiness levels and lottery winners compared to quadriplegic patients. And the results were really surprising. He found that after one year of living with change, both groups leveled out at the same level of happiness. This is really surprising because we all imagine how much happier we'd be if we won the lottery. But it turns out that this is just a trick the, play, the brain plays on us. Gilbert talks about studies which found that after three months, even major life trauma, with a few exceptions, has no impact on happiness. That's an interesting fact to consider. Gilbert also explains that we're equipped with a non-conscious cognitive process that helps us change our views of the world. So again, let's go a little deeper. The frontal lobe is the part of the brain located directly behind the forehead and is responsible for behavior, learning, personality, and voluntary movement. This is the part of the brain that separates humans from other animals. The prefrontal cortex is located in the frontal lobe. And Gilbert explains this part of the brain as an experience simulator that allows us to imagine experiences without having to have them. No other animal has this ability. So according to Gilbert, the brain generates two types of happiness, natural and synthetic. He defines natural happiness as the result of getting something we wanted and synthetic happiness as what we make when we don't get what we wanted. What he's saying is that it's possible to create your own happiness. However, our society has strong beliefs that synthetic happiness is inferior to natural happiness. So I wanna talk about why that's wrong. What we can take away from Gilbert's research is a happy life is not always about getting what you want. It's about learning to enjoy what you get. So synthetic happiness is not cheating yourself to happier. Natural happiness primarily relies on external factors, whereas synthetic happiness primarily relies on internal factors. So as such, synthetic happiness can be a more long-term, stable form of happiness than natural happiness. General happiness in life comes from the relationship between natural happiness and synthetic happiness. Serotonin is considered a happy hormone because of its mood-boosting effects. Lack of the hormone is associated with depression. And you can give yourself a boost of serotonin by doing a few different things. Focusing on positive memories for things you're grateful for will produce more serotonin. Get more sunshine. When sunlight is absorbed by our skin, vitamin D is produced, which in turn helps produce serotonin. And low intensity exercise, such as going for a walk, boosts the release of serotonin. And that's an interesting fact because I take my dog Bliss for a walk every single day 
We go for long walks in nature, around water, in the forest, even just through neighborhoods. And I'm out in the sunshine and both of us, my dog and I, always feel better afterwards. Dopamine is a pleasure hormone. It increases our drive to accomplish a goal so we can experience the pleasure of the reward. Give yourself a boost of, a boost of dopamine by setting specific measurable goals and achieving them. This can be as simple as making your bed in the morning. Dopamine levels rise with, when serotonin during exercise. And I can honestly say I am a dopamine junkie. I feel better every single day just from exercising. And then there's oxycotin, oxytocin, which is the love hormone and is released upon physical contact. So from birth to a hug, oxytocin is there providing feelings of love and trust. So you can give yourself a boost of oxytocin by getting a massage. This prolonged physical contact releases oxytocin. Hugging a loved one, holding hands, cuddling, all of those things. The ancient Greeks defined happiness as happiness is the joy that we feel when we're striving after our potential. Aristotle says happiness is a state of activity. Eleanor Roosevelt said, someone once asked me what I regarded as the three most important requirements for happiness. My answer was a feeling that you have been honest with yourself and those around you. A feeling that you've done the best you could both in your personal life and in your work. And the ability to love others. And I couldn't agree more. I know for me that when I stay in alignment with what I know I want for myself, when I follow through with what I say I'm going to do, when I'm striving for a goal that I want, I always feel happier. It makes me love myself more and that in turn makes me happier. Michael J. Fox said, my happiness grows in direct proportion to my acceptance and in inverse proportion to my expectations. So how would you define happiness yourself? You should really take a moment after this and journal about it. And get some clarity on what makes you happy. Director of the Harvard Study of Adult Development, Robert Wallinger, shares findings from an ongoing study regarding happiness. The study is 75 years in the making, starting in 1938 with a group of Harvard College students. The study has evolved to include more participants, and every two years, a research group conducts interviews, obtains medical records, and completes brain, brain scans. Walden states, the clearest message that we get from the 75-year study is this, good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. So the three main lessons learned from the study are about relationships. The more socially connected someone is to family, friends, and community, the healthier and happier they are. People who are isolated suffer from poor health and are less happy. The next lesson learned is regarding the quality of relationships. Someone can be in a crowd and still lonely. So the number of friends someone has doesn't indicate whether or not they're happy, but having close relationships and close connections does. The final lesson learned is that good relationships don't just protect our bodies, they protect our brains too. The study found that when participants had others to lean on, and continually develop close relationships, these individuals experienced more overall happiness. So we know the importance of having good relationships to be happy, but how do we develop and sustain good relationships? This can be as simple as replacing screen time with face-to-face -face time with the people you care about or are cultivating new relationships with or have long conversations with people that you are close to when you can't get together. Liven up a relationship by doing something new together. Reestablish date night or start a weekly game night with friends. Reach out to a family member you've lost touch with. 
Try joining a group of like-minded individuals. Websites such as Meetup are great meeting places for meeting new people. Maybe you want to join a walking group or learn a new skill. Whatever you're interested in, simply type it in in the subject line and you'll find meetups nearby. And dating sites now have BFF choices where you can find a friend. Believe it or not, I did this 16 years ago when I first got divorced and BFFs were not part of it. I just wrote to a couple of women and I explained that I was heterosexual, but all my friends were married and I was single now and I wanted some single friends that I could go out with. And one of those, I, I hooked up with two different women and one of them is one of my very best friends to this day. And when I moved to California five years ago, I did the exact same thing again and I still have a friend from that. It's really a great way to do it. So gratitude is a great way to foster a happier disposition. Robert Emmons, PhD, has been coined the world's leading scientific expert on gratitude. His research findings show that people who regularly practice gratitude report experience more joy, pleasure, optimism, happiness, and higher levels of positive emotions. Emmons emphasizes the importance of making a distinction between feeling grateful and being grateful. According to Emmons, feelings develop from the way we see the world, the thoughts we have about the way things are, and the perceptions of the way we think things should be. Being grateful, on the other hand, is a choice. It's really important. It's a choice. Gratitude provides a perspective from which we can view life in its entirety and not be overwhelmed by temporary circumstances, says Emmons. So let's take a look at a few techniques for being more grateful. Start a gratitude journal. Set aside time before bed to recall and record moments of gratitude. Name three things that you're grateful for and make at least one of them something that you're grateful for from that day. Then name one thing you wish you could have done and commit to doing it the next day. Prayers of gratitude are considered in many spiritual traditions as the most powerful form of prayer. Practice the motions, smiling, saying thank you, writing letters of gratitude regularly will strengthen the emotion of gratitude. Each circumstance offers an opportunity for gratitude, so be creative and look for new situations where you can express gratitude. Mindfulness is defined as a mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment while calmly acknowledging and accepting one's feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations used as a therapeutic technique. Ultimately, mindfulness is the focus on the here and now. Be here now. Achieving mindfulness is not as easy, though, and takes practice. Research has shown those who practice mindfulness regularly are happier because their thoughts are not consumed by thoughts of fear for something yet to come. Controlling future situations or analyzing circumstances that have passed. Staying in the present. Worrying about things that haven't happened, that may never happen, that usually don't happen. Takes you out of mindfulness. Mindfulness teaches the ability to center yourself and develop your inner resources, which deepens happiness. Mindfulness can lead to happiness by ending the loop of negative thoughts, helping you connect better with others, and deepening inner contentment, enhancing the experience of gratitude. Mindfulness doesn't happen automatically, but with a little practice, we can retrain the brain. Try this exercise to get you started. It's called the five senses exercise. So the goal of mindfulness is to focus on the current moment, and this exercise will help you get started. Notice five things that you can see. Try focusing on something you don't normally notice, like a shadow or a leaf. Then notice four things you can feel. Bring your awareness to things you currently feel the texture of your clothing, the way your body sits on the chair, a breeze in the air. Then notice three things you can hear. 
Listen and mentally note three things you can hear. A bird chirping, the hum of the refrigerator, a clock ticking, the TV in the background. Notice two things you can smell and try to identify smells you wouldn't normally notice. And then no, no, notice one thing you can taste. It can be a sip of water, a gum, even your saliva in your mouth. Just try to notice one thing you can taste. And that's the exercise. Give it a try. Once you're comfortable with the idea of mindfulness, try this technique to deepen your practice. Number one, turn off automatic pilot by bringing awareness to what you're doing, thinking, and sensing in this moment. Take a moment to settle into a comfortable posture and then notice the thoughts that come up and acknowledge your feelings, but let them pass. Number two, bringing awareness to your breath. Focus only on the act of breathing and how your body reacts with each breath. So for example, how does your chest rise and fall and your belly push in and out and feel your lungs expand and contract? And then find the pattern of your breath and anchor yourself to the present with this awareness. And step three, expand your awareness outward by noticing the sensations that you're experiencing, like tightness or aches or perhaps a lightness in your face or shoulders. You can take this step further by expanding your awareness even further to the environment all around you. So Nancy Edkoff is an evolutionary psychologist and in, in the, in, the instructor of the science of happiness at Harvard Medical School. Her research into the question of happiness exposes surprising results. Her findings reinforce things we should have known all along, like the fact that Having flowers in the house does make us happier. In her TED Talk, Edkoff says, we are wired to pursue happiness, not only to enjoy it, but to want more and more of it. One of the key points in the science of happiness is that happiness and unhappiness are not endpoints of a single continuum. In a study of recovering hospital patients, two groups were examined. One group faced a brick wall, while another looked out on trees and nature. The group who looked out on the brick wall were in the hospital longer, needed more medication, and had more medical complications. According to Edkoff, happiness is a contagious. Happiness is contagious, and our happiness will have a positive effect on our friends, but also on our friends' friends. Research is growing on the connection that nature makes us happier and healthier. A 30-day study was conducted that involved people doing something wild every day for a consecutive 30 days. And by wild, they're implying in the wild, getting out in nature. Participants were asked to complete a survey at the beginning and end of the study about their perceived connection to nature, how they interacted with nature, and how they felt about their health and happiness. The study showed that there was a significant, scientifically significant increase in people's health, happiness, and connection to nature just by being encouraged to spend time in it. Amazingly, the participants' newfound happiness was even sustained for months following the challenge. One theory accounting for the nature happiness link is the biophilia hypothesis, which suggests that we love nature because we evolved in it. Nature teaches us that there is nothing wrong with us. In fact, studies show that people's body image improves by focusing on nature. The diversity found in nature reinforces the beauty in being different. Time slows down, urgency and deadlines melt away. Ecosystems embody harmony and balance. Quietly witnessing this balance and harmony renews our appreciation. Nature calls you back to reality, allowing you to surrender comfort, control, and reinforces acceptance. And as we remove the chaotic noises of society and place them with sounds of nature, we become calmer. Being in nature provides a sense of awe. We realize there are things at play much larger than ourselves. So take a moment and name one thing you love about being in nature. 
What about nature makes you happy? What makes me happy about being in nature and I'm in it every day is just the beauty and the variety of everything I'm seeing. The fall trees or the wildflowers. It's like every season, it's beautiful. The blue skies, the white clouds, the water, the rivers, the oceans, the mountains. I love it all. And I feel good in all kinds of nature and in every season. Studies show lottery winners do not become significantly happier than they were before. Extremely rich people are not significantly happier than others either. Researchers found that possessing wealth and material goods does not lead to happiness. Giving them away actually does. Studies of people who practice volunteering have shown that they have better psychological mental health and increased longevity. Another study has showed donating money or spending money on experiences rather than material goods is positively correlated with happiness. By being more generous and altruistic, happiness increases with the amount of money you give to people in need by volunteering or spending more time with helping others. Here's a list of different ways to give back without spending money. You can volunteer for a cause you care about. You can cook for those in need. You can give blood. You can become a mentor. You can spend time with a loved one or a friend who is ill. You can assist seniors in need. You can lift a soldier's spirits. You can help build a house. You can share your skills. You can go out and pick up trash. Of course, there are many, many others. You can just get creative with it. So here are my final tips that are proven techniques to cultivate more happiness. Savor the moment. Take control of your time. Act happy. Dance. Exercise. Make time for sleep. Give time and attention to close relationships. Be mindful. Express gratitude. And give more. And the key to happiness is knowing that you have the power to choose what to accept and what to let go of. So how does that quote make you feel? For me, I feel empowered and excited that I know I have the choice to choose happiness. It's my ability to choose. I can look at what's right instead of what's wrong. I can let go of fear and I can live in faith. I can choose to be happier. And so can you. Here are some resources that I used while putting together this class. So you can just take a screenshot of it or pick up your phone and take a shot of it. And then you can look up any of these articles you want. So that was a great event for me. I feel better just having talked to you about it. And thanks for sharing it with me. I'm always here to support you. Coaching is the best way to make a real change in your life. And of all the things successful people do, working with a coach is at the top of the list. I help my clients clarify their goals, work through their fears and disempowering beliefs, set realistic and achievable action steps, and help them live and maintain the values they set for themselves. I will be your accountability partner and help you stay focused on the path to your dreams. And I have a special offer that I give at the end of my webinars. One discovery call and two one-on-one -on -one private coaching calls, all for the price of one. All you have to do is go on my website and sign up for a session and write that you took this webinar on your appointment. Just name the webinar. And I look forward to working with you. So I hope you take advantage of this offer. And I promise you that you will feel better about yourself you will have more direction, and you will have specific tools to help you create the life that you desire. So thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And thanks for coming here.